So this is the second part of our focus on disability and in this video we're going to look at social discrimination against disabled people and yes we're going to talk about the medical versus the social model of disability. Okay, yeah, back in the studio. I forgot to say last video, back in the studio. But yeah, I'm in the studio. So I've got the, you know, the screen behind me and try not to rely too much on PowerPoint, but you know, occasionally I might have to flick up a slide because we've got a bit of material to get through here. Okay, disability as a social problem. Remember here we are looking at how people fit or don't fit into our social structures. If you go back to episode eight um, and have another look at that video, um, yeah, if you're not too clear on the difference between culture and, and cultural issues and social issues, have a look at that video. Did that make sense? In the last episode, episode nine, we're looking at disability as a cultural problem. Now let's look at two key social institutions to examine disability as a social problem. And we're gonna look at employment and education. These are two institutions we're all expected to participate in at one time or another in our lives. And we're gonna focus on disabled adults here. Now the, the following is from the Disabled People's Organizations of Australia. They've produced a fact sheet and I'll put a link up in the description box below. Uh, they, have um, they have data that shows that in Australia, disabled people are nearly twice as likely to be unemployed as people without disabilities or non-disabled people. Now, Australia is not a good place to be if you're disabled. We have one of the lowest employment participation rates among OECD countries. It's the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. So we're one of the worst of those countries in relation to employment of disabled people. And there's a gender difference going on here too. Disabled women are less likely to be employed than disabled men. With 50%, 51% of disabled men are employed compared to 44% of disabled women. Now, if employed, disabled women receive lower wages than men and are more likely to be in precarious informal subsistence or vulnerable employment or part-time employment. Now, many young disabled people don't enter the labour market at all over the first seven post-school years and end up much more likely to become long-term unemployed. All of this happens even though we have evidence that convincingly shows that disabled people are no less productive in employment than non-disabled people. So it's absolutely about unjustified discrimination. Now what about education? Well, 41% of disabled people aged 15 to 64 years have completed year 12, compared with 63% for non-disabled people. 17% uh, of disabled people have completed a bachelor degree compared with 30% of non-disabled people. So again, what you're seeing here is discrimination. So many disabled people are excluded from two of society's main social systems, employment and education. Now all of these social statistics hi that highlight these structural patterns of discrimination against disabled people has given the impetus, impetus for the development of a social model of disability. Yes, that's coming. We're gonna get onto the social model. But first, let's have a think about what causes impairment. Now with the stats we just saw on employment and education, we could debate whether it's unfair discrimination that causes the social exclusion or whether it's just reflective of the low capacity of disabled people to learn an education or to work productively. By the way, it's not that. They're no better, no worse than anyone else. Now, how about the actual impairment that people have? What causes that? Now here comes the surprises. Well, maybe it's a surprise for you. First of all, in spite of all of the research funding that's been poured into such things as the Genome Project, disability is rarely caused by faulty genes. In fact, there's seldom any form of biological cause for impairment. Here we're talking about broad statistics, big picture stuff. Of course, some people acquire impairments due to genetic problems or biological problems, but that makes up only a small proportion of people with impairment. 90% of impairment is caused by socioeconomic factors like poverty. And actually, poverty is the biggest cause of impairment. This is not because disabled people become poor when they acquire an impairment, though that does happen. You know, you lose your job when you become disabled because you face discrimination in the labor market. Yep, uh, you become disabled, then you become poor. That does happen. But mostly what we find is that people acquire an impairment 
when they're poor. This is the link between poverty and disability for most people around the world. It's poverty that causes impairments rather than impairments that cause poverty. You know, worldwide, one in five people acquire an impairment due to the effects of malnutrition. Among the other major causes of impairment are physical abuse, industrial accidents, environmental pollution, effects of psychological stress, and so on. Yet they're all causal agents that are located in the social context, in the social environment. What's interesting here, it's actually not true to say that there's rarely a medical cause for impairment. But it's not true for a surprising reason. And, and that's because one of the major causes of impairment is actually medical intervention. This is called iatrogenesis. That's death or disease that's caused by medical intervention. Now it's hard to get an accurate figure on how many people are impacted by this, largely because of the issue of underreporting. Doctors and hospitals don't often own up to their mistakes because if they do, they can be sued for very, very large sums of money and such large sums of money that it could actually threaten the viability of the healthcare sector. You know, <laughs> so that's why the underreporting largely goes on. In the US, the medical system has been cited as the leading cause of death and injury. I mean, it, it sounds bonkers, isn't it? It sounds bonkers. Medicine helps us, but actually it can hurt us as well. Now, the medical profession has not only given us a language we can use to talk about impairment, but it's often created impairment. You know, it's a stark reminder of the importance of socioeconomic and social political perspectives on impairment. Oh my God, I just quoted myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ducker. Have you come across Ducker? Oh, he's a gem. What a sweetie. Here's another quote. Farmageddon is the prospect of a world in which medicines produce more ill health than health, and when medical progress does more harm than good. But Farmageddon, people are describing this is a, an era we're approaching, where medicine actually kills more people than it cures. Here's what we know. Socioeconomic factors rather than genetic factors are responsible for most impairments, and medicine sometimes offers effective treatments for impairments, but also often causes those impairments in the first place. We know that most impairments could be prevented with nutrition, with social support, and other low-tech interventions. Most impairments do not require sophisticated and costly medical interventions. Here's a nice quote. Social attention and resources are being deflected into medical technology and professional salaries when they could be providing nutrition, social support, and other low technology strategies to minimize disability or to cushion its impact. Now, up to half of the world's disabled population have impairments that can be prevented or remedied for the price of a few pounds per head. So, impairments mostly have a socioeconomic, not a biological origin. For example, Legactyl. This is a prescribed tranquilizer that caused brain damage in 25 million people. That's 25 million people suffered brain damage because they took this prescribed medication. There's 25 million people with impairments that just got created just from one pharmaceutical product. So that's an example of that itrogenesis, death or injury caused by medical interventions. So as for the majority of the world's disabled people, impairment is very clearly primarily the consequence of social and political factors, not an unavoidable fact of nature. That comes from Abilene. But the social environment not only creates impairment, it also disables people who have impairments. This is the crucial point that guides us to the social model of disability. Da da da, we made it. This is the point at which disability moves from being a noun, something that someone has, as in a person with a disability, and it moves to being a verb, you know, something that is done to someone, a disabled person, becomes a verb, to disable. So the dominant way of thinking about disabled people since the 1800s onwards has been the medical model. Here are how terms impairment and disability are defined under that approach. Impairment is any loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological, or anatomical structure or function. And disability is any restriction or lack resulting from an impairment of ability to perform an activity in the, main, in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Now this medical model gives rise to a cure or care approach. If a disabled person cannot be cured by medical intervention, then they need to be cared for through welfare provision. And under the medical model, the power to define disability is mostly, actually always really, held by professionals. 
and is out of the control of disabled people themselves. Now the social model, yes we got there, the social model has been brought in as an alternative to the medical model and it's been developed by the disability movement. The social movement that aims to protect and promote the civil rights of disabled people. Now under the social model, the definitions of impairment remain the same, but the definition of disability changes. So impairment is still described as in the same way, um, but disability is the definition that's changed. It's, um, change definition here, this change definition here. This comes from Disabled People International, DPI. So impairment, yeah, so it's the same as before under the medical model, but now disability becomes redefined as the loss or limitation of opportunities to take part in the normal life of the community on an equal level with others due to physical and social barriers. So this gives rise to a social action approach to disability, where the solution to dis disability is the removal of social and economic and physical barriers, barriers that make the social, economic and physical environment hostile to the disabled person. It rejects the traditional approach, the medical approach, medical model approach, which is all about rehabilitating the disabled person to the hostile environment in which they live, you know, an environment that they are experiencing all those barriers from, you know, get them used to it. Um, and if you can't get them used to it, just take them away from it and stick them in hospital. <laughs> Put them away, lock them up, lock, lock them up. <laughs> if they can't cope, lock them up. So here's a, a full definition of the social model. The present forms of architectural structures and social institutions exist because statutes, ordinances and codes either required or permitted them to be constructed in that manner. And these public policies imply values, expectations and assumptions about the physical and behavioural attributes that people ought to possess in order to survive or to participate in community life. Uh, it is society that disables physically disabled people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. So disability does not arise in individuals but in the barriers society erects. Disability is about social exclusion and social oppression. It's about an understanding of how social power functions in society to exclude disabled people. So it's not impairment that causes disability, but a lack of access to buildings, to transport, to employment, to education and so on, that leads people to become disabled. They're disabled by a social environment that doesn't accommodate for their impairments. So what this leads us to is deciding that it's time to change the world, not the individual. You know, it's time to change the social environment rather than trying to change the individual. Now think about how these different models, the medical model and the social model, would impact on you, say if you're a psychologist, and you were assessing a disabled client. Here is you guided by a medical model. So you, you, you'd say something like, or ask your client something like, what complaint causes you difficulty in holding, gripping, or turning things? What was that accent? Why did I speak like that? Anyway, so that's the sort of question. Nothing really that unusual in that question. Kind of the question you'd expect from a clinician, perhaps. Here's what you would sound like if you were guided by a social model. So what defects in the design of everyday equipment like jars, bottles and lids cause you difficulty in holding, gripping or turning them? So initially it's a bit of an odd question, you know, we're not used to these types of questions, but once your client gets their head around the question, something changes. Suddenly they realise that you do not see them as the problem. Here's another question to just show how this works. Under a medical model, a clinician might say something like, does your disability affect your work in any way at present? And now the social model, here the question would be, do you have problems at work as a result of the physical environment or the attitudes of your co-workers? So again, you're repositioning the locus of the problem. You don't see the problem with the individual, you see the problem in their social environment. Now imagine you see a friend or a member of your family upset and you ask them, you know, what's wrong with you? Now think about what changes if instead of asking what's wrong with you, that you ask what's gone wrong for you? Do you see that difference? There's, you know, there's a subtle difference. You're locating the possible source of the problem outside of the person and into their social environment. 
Now, there is a problem here. The social model has largely been developed by a small minority of younger disabled people, white male wheelchair baroned, who have non-chronic, relatively stable, though perhaps severe, uh, forms of impairment. Now, the social model works for them, but not for other disabled people, particularly those who experience chronic pain. So to say that society is disabling you doesn't really capture your full experience of disability if you if you have that embodied experience of the impairment that you're living with chronic pain you're less likely to think that it's actually social barriers that are causing you the problem it's actually you're in a lot of pain you know the social barriers are not the only source of your pain now the other problem is more generally with the disability movement it's tended to include most impairments except for two broad groups of impairment people who've got intellectual impairments and the second group is people with a diagnosis of mental illness or psychologically Im impaired you can often find these two groups being pointed to as the other as they're the disabled people, you know, they're the, they're the badly disabled people. So a disabled person might claim that they're not mental or stupid. You know, they'll differentiate themselves from people with an intellectual impairment. You know, look, I'm, I'm disabled. I'm not stupid, i.e. I'm not like that bunch. Or they'll say, look, I'm disabled. I'm not mental. I haven't lost my mind, i.e. I'm not like that bunch over there. So they differentiate themselves from people with cognitive and psychological impairments. So these two groups in the disability movement have for a long time been excluded from the movement or marginalised in the movement, slowly changing, but it's still a problem for the disability movement. Okay, we've run out of time. It's, oh boy, <laughs> it's been a long session on disability, which gives us lots to talk about um, in the tutorial. And we can talk through that particular issue, if you like, about those two groups who are excluded when we meet in our online tutorial. Now, if you aren't enrolled in the unit, why not drop a few comments down in the uh, comment box on the YouTube channel under this video and see if you can get some discussion rolling along there. Also, you might want to start thinking about the connections from video episode 8 and previous episodes on this unit where we talk about the social self and think about the connections between the social model of disability and those ideas about human behaviour only properly being understood as an interaction between the person and their environment. You might find some resonance there. So in the next video, we're going to talk about one of those groups of disabled people that is particularly marginalised, even by some in the disability movement people who have been diagnosed as mentally ill. And what I'm going to do there is I'm going to bring in some of the videos that I've already recorded for my YouTube channel that week. So you'll see them in Moodle. I'll put the links up in Moodle. If you're enrolled in the unit, you'll see them there. Um, I'll put the links to those specific videos in the description box below this video so you can pick them up if you can't access Moodle. Okay, I'll leave it there. So... Till next time, ta-da.